Tonight we're going to talk about Jeremiah's letter to the exiles. Jeremiah 27 and 28 address the two major themes that continue through chapter 29. The Lord delivered Judah into the hands of the Babylonians. So the people of Judah, whether currently exiled in Babylonia or remaining in Judah, need to accept Babylonian rule. The Lord will not help them win if they instigate a rebellion. False prophets are busy now. Hananiah prophesied that the Lord would deliver the exiles from Babylonia within two years a direct contradiction of Jeremiah's prophecy that the exile would last for at least 70 years. Because Hananiah prophesied falsely, the Lord took his life that same year. In chapter 29, Jeremiah sends a letter to the people of Judah and Jerusalem who were taken into exile in Babylonia. The letter was written between uh, the 597 exile and the 587 destruction of Jerusalem. Following our reading, Jeremiah tells the people not to believe the false prophets who predict an early return. Yahweh says, after 70 years are accomplished for Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. Jeremiah then directs his attention to King Zedekiah and the people still living in Judah. He tells them that while they have escaped the exile to Babylonia, they have not escaped God's judgment, nor are they better than the exiles. They will experience the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, and God will make them like vile figs that can't be eaten because they're so bad. Because they have not listened to my word, says Yahweh. This mention of bad figs alludes to chapter 24, where the Lord showed Jeremiah two baskets of figs, one good and the other bad, very bad, that can't be eaten, they are so bad. It was not the people who escaped the exile who were the good figs, but those who were taken away to Babylon. The Lord promises to bring them back to Judah and build them and plant them. But the Lord will make of King Zedekiah and the people remaining in Judah a reproach and a proverb, a taunt and a core curse. Jeremiah mentioned Zedekiah and Ahab, whom the king of Babylon roasted in the fire because they have worked folly in Israel and have committed adultery with their neighbor's wives and have spoken words falsely in Yahweh's name, words which Yahweh did not command them. Then Jeremiah addresses the false prophet, Shemaiah, and his false prophecies. He says that the Lord will punish Shemaiah so that he will not have a man to dwell among his people. Neither shall he see the good that I will do for my people, says Yahweh, because he has spoken rebellion against the Lord. Jeremiah is writing from Jerusalem to the exiles in Babylonia. He specifies the groups of people he wants to address. The elders are the men of authority within the community, usually older and presumably wiser. The remainder or residue of the elders suggests that some of the elders have died either before the exile, during the difficult journey to Babylon, or at the hands of the Babylonians after they arrived. Those elders, priests, and prophets remaining would constitute the Jewish leadership into the future. In chapter 26, the religious leaders, the priests and prophets, said of Jeremiah, this man is worthy of death, for he has prophesied against Jerusalem. But the officials and all the people said, this man is not worthy of death, for he has spoken to us in the name of Yahweh, our God. And the elders counseled, counseled that they were about to bring great disaster on themselves if they tried to kill Jeremiah. Second Kings 24 provides an account of the king of Babylon taking prisoner King Jehoiakim, his mother and his servants and his princes and his officers. Nebuchadnezzar also carried away all the golden artifacts from the temple and carried away all the leading people of Judah so that no one remained except the poorest people of the land. Now Jeremiah's bag goes into the diplomatic mailbag. He entrusts it to two people that are King Zedekiah's emissaries or couriers who send and take messages back and forth to King Nebuchadnezzar. 
It may be that Zedekiah sends two men instead of one as a security measure. As a vassal, Zedekiah has responsibility to keep Nebuchadnezzar well informed of what's going on back in Judah. If he were to send a single courier and that courier failed to complete the mission, the consequences for Zedekiah could be serious. Sending two men with this important letter increases the likelihood of a successful mission. Thus says Yahweh of the armies, the God of Israel, to all the captivity whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Jeremiah begins this verse with the standard formula for introducing a prophetic message. He makes it clear that Yahweh, rather than Nebuchadnezzar, is responsible for the exile. Nebuchadnezzar is only allowed to act as Yahweh's agent. But now Jeremiah has a new message. Build houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat their fruit. Verses 5 and 6 encourage the exiles to settle down for the duration, to make Babylon their new home. Jeremiah is trying to counter the influence of those false prophets who tell the people they'll only be there about two years. He's trying to help the exiles face the reality that the Lord plans to leave them in Babylonia for seven decades. The Babylonians gave the Judean exiles considerable freedom to do exactly the things God told them to do. The elders were allowed to exert their leadership, as did the prophets. They had no doubt tasked to perform for the state, but otherwise could lead a reasonably normal life. In fact, life in Babylonia will prove sufficiently comfortable that some of the exiles will decide to remain there when they're finally allowed to return to Jerusalem. Build and plant are words central to Jeremiah's calling. The Lord appointed him in the beginning to pluck up and break down and destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. There's been a lot of plucking up and pulling down, a lot of destroying and overthrowing. Those have been accomplished. So now it's time to think about the building and the planting. The building and the planting to be done are an expression of the faith that the Lord will redeem them when the time is right. Even though they're in a foreign land, they can dedicate their new houses to the Lord and the first fruits of their new crops. Take wives and father sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so they may bear more sons and daughters and multiply there. Don't be diminished. Be fruitful. Multiply has been a recurring admonition from the beginning for God's people. The Lord's concern here is that the people of Judah grow in numbers and strength during this exile, even as they did during their long sojourn in Egypt. They are not to wither and disappear, as did the people of the northern kingdom during their exile a century and a half earlier. Seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive and pray to Yahweh for it, for in its peace you will find your peace. Everything that Jeremiah has said from the beginning has been controversial. He has advised the king and people of Judah to cooperate with the Babylonians. He has encouraged them to accept the reality of a lengthy captivity. Now he embarks on his most controversial advice, encouraging Judeans to pray for the shalom, for the peace and prosperity of their captors, and to recognize that their own shalom is dependent on the shalom of the Babylonian people. But Jeremiah's counsel does not constitute a directive for them to assimilate into the dominant culture or to embrace its maxims, values, or patterns of behavior. No, they're to continue to follow Yahweh, to observe his laws faithfully, even as they pray for those around them who do not. It's ironic that Jeremiah was told not to pray for Judah. It's nevertheless understandable. The Lord had a plan to redeem Judah, but that plan required the subjugation first by Babylonia. Therefore, the Lord could not have answered Jeremiah's prayers if Jeremiah prayed that the Lord would spare Judah. But now the Lord's plan calls for his people to endure a lengthy stay in Babylonia, so it's in keeping with the Lord's plan that the Babylonians will prosper. Earlier, Jeremiah prayed for his enemies, even as they plotted to kill him. 
In the New Testament, Jesus will say, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who mistreat you and persecute you. He also said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. Even though we're quite familiar with these New Testament verses, they remain difficult for us to hear and to observe. Jeremiah prefers, proposes a lengthy exile, but the exile will not spell the end of Judah. It's for the purpose of purifying Judah, even as gold is purified in the fire. The chapters that immediately follow are known as the Book of Consolation, chapters 30 through 33, because they tell us about the restoration of Judah that will follow the exile. The promise of restoration is a significant prophecy. The people of Judah has seen the ten tribes of Israel, the whole northern kingdom, disappear after they were taken into exile by Assyria in 722 B.C. They experienced no restoration. They never returned. The closest thing to a remnant for those tribes was the Samaritans, whom the people of Judah despised. Jeremiah, who has delivered mostly bad news, now holds out the promise that the people of Judah will not suffer the same fate as their northern neighbors. The Lord will restore them to their land and to their proper status as God's own people. But first, they must experience the exile, which is the Lord's provision for purifying them and making them worthy. Seek the welfare for the city where I've sent you into exile and pray to God on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. This the prophet Jeremiah writes from Judah to his fellow Jews who are in exile in Babylon. Miles from home, separated from their culture, with no temple, far from the geographical heart of their faith. They're separated from people they love, family members and sweethearts. They are hostages in a place where they do not even speak the language. And now they hear they have no realistic hope of going home during their lifetime if they're adults. Perhaps it will happen for their children. And if their children do go back to Jerusalem, what? The businesses will be gone, their family members dead, their homes inhabited by someone else if they've not been destroyed. Will their grown children know Hebrew or worship God having grown up abroad? Jeremiah tells them to live fully there in Babylon, to have family, to create generations. He tells them to live, don't live as exiles to the extent you don't have to, abide by their rules because you must, but then just live as God's people. Jeremiah tells the exiles in Babylon, do whatever you have to do to survive this, to live, but meanwhile, live and love as fully and comprehensively as if you were with us here in Jerusalem. And then he tells them more. They shouldn't just expand their families and live. They should proactively promote the welfare of the Babylonians, the ones who hold them captive. They should help them out. They should pray to God to bless them. The hostages in Babylon are told to make their captivity into a time of spiritual discipline. In that, a time of showing true mercy to all around them, even their captors, even their neighbors who can't be bothered to care for them. Why? Because the oppression of the Jews is justified and the Babylonians should be rewarded by it? No. Because the Jews should have gratitude for being hostages? No. Because the Jews' welfare was intimately bound up with that of their captors. In every society, the welfare of every last person around us is bound up with our own. We can't really thrive until everyone around us can thrive. Seek the welfare of San Antonio and Oak Meadow, where I have sent you into exile, and pray to God on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. I hope very much that you do not feel exiled to these places. On the contrary, I hope you feel affirmed and free and fully alive. I hope this is exactly where you want to be. But maybe you feel exiled to the land of old age, 
Or maybe you feel exiled to the land of poor health. Or maybe you feel exiled to the land of the oldest generation. No matter how you feel or where you are, seek the welfare of the community around you, for its welfare is intimately tied up with your own. Jeremiah tells us that especially when we know ourselves to be the other, the different one, the outsider, it's time for spiritual discipline, for showing mercy to others and for seeking their welfare. It is our otherness that may give us the capacity to do so. This world is not our home and geography does not define us. We must find our home in God until he takes us to his home. Thanks be to God who cares for his own wherever they are. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always precede and follow us wherever we go that we may continually be given to good works and prayers for those around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.